I was thinking about the sermon this morning, and it reminded me of one of the wonderful blessings that God has granted my wife and I, and that's the ability to travel. And as we would cross borders, we always ran across a question that just baffled me. We would come in from Canada into the United States, and the guard there at the border would stick his head in the window and go, you guys have any illegal drugs or weapons? What? This is how you're securing me? You expect me to go, oh, you caught me. I didn't think you were going to ask that question. Yeah, I've got some drugs and weapons in the trunk. Sorry. Didn't think you were going to ask that question. Now, I know there's probably more subtlety to it. They're probably looking for the way in how you answer that. But that question just always blew my mind. Do you have any illegal weapons or drugs? No. Can I go? Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> but, you know, one of my favorite genres of movies to watch are westerns. And those ding-dongs did the same thing. You have the sentry guard outside the fort. Up rides a horse. Halt! Friend or foe? You got me. I was an enemy. I was trying to sneak in. But you know, it really is a good question. Because are we a friend or a foe? Are we a friend of God or are we an enemy of God? How did they know who was a friend and foe? That I don't know. I'm sure it was some subtle way that you would answer the question or maybe the way you would look or body language or something. But when it comes to God's word, I know exactly how to determine if we are a friend or a foe of God. And that answer is found in the book of James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. To spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There's the answer. What we need to do, and that's what we're going to look at this morning, is three things about this verse. Two that are right out there, and one is kind of the reverse. The first thing we want to look at is when he says that we are, that the world is, uh, excuse me, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. What's he talking about? It's a fancy biblical world, enmity. So I want to look at enmity and see what they're talking about there. And then I want to look at the fact that um, when we make friends with the world, we become enemies of God. We become foes of God. And then the actual opposite that, of that then. If we find out what makes us enemies of God, what makes us friends of God? Because I'm sure everyone here wants to be a friend of God. I'm sure there's nobody that came to church today going, <laughs> I'm going to show them, I'm going to show up. No, you're here because you love God, and you want to know more about God, and you want to praise God. Especially this time of year, when the world is celebrating the birth of Christ. Maybe you want to know more about what this is all about. So I want to look at, what does it take to be a friend of God? So let's start off. That word enmity, kind of a hard word to say, because N-M is not a natural combination right there. So, the word enmity itself means a hostile opposition or hatred of another. In other words, this is not, you know what, I'm not sure whether I like you or not. I'm not sure if I believe in you or not. This is a hostile opposition. As I said before in James, that he was talking about, you don't get so you murder. It's a hostile opposition. It's a hatred of another person. I'll give you this example. If we were to oppose a government, 
to the point that we were willing to take up arms and overthrow that government. That means that we have enmity for that government. We hate it so much that we are willing to risk our own lives in war to take out that government out of power. And what we're referring to here in the book of James is having that same feeling for God. That God is not doing things right. This world is a mess and I can do it better. So I'm going to show them how it's done. Forget this. This is old. This is outdated. The last writings in there were like 70 AD. That was like 2,000 years ago. Forget that. Let me show you a better way. That's enmity toward God. In the book of Numbers, chapter 35, verse 20 and 21, we see that the motive there of anger and hatred. And if you push, uh, excuse me, let me back up just a little bit and kind of give you a little background here. We're told that the Hebrews were to create six cities of refuge. So if anyone killed another involuntary, say like involuntary manslaughter, they had a place to go for protection so that the family wouldn't come and try to avenge their death. But there are conditions to getting into this, these cities of refuge. And that's where we come up with Numbers 31, 20 and 20, 35, 20 through 21. He says, and if he pushed him out of hatred or hurled something at him lying in wait so that he died or in enmity struck him down, in other words, out of anger, out of hatred, with his hands so that he died, then he who struck the blow shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. So he doesn't get access to these cities of refuge. You're on your own. And if we catch you, we're going to get the harmed party and they'll come back and they're going to put you to death. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about enmity. It's a mind of the flesh. This worldly thought of the way world, the world does things. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. <coughs> Excuse me. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace, because the mind of the flesh is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the laws of God, neither indeed can it be, for they that are of the flesh cannot please God. If you want to be in enmity with God, in opposition to God, do things your own way. Have the mind of flesh, of the world, of I can do it better. And not follow God's word. You then put yourself in opposition to God. We had the Lord's Supper this morning. I don't like grape juice. It's kind of sour and tart. I suggest we put Kool-Aid in the cups. We can make it red, but it'll taste better. I am ignoring God's word, and I am putting myself in opposition to God. And that there are people out there who will replace it with other substances. <coughs> and call themselves followers of Christ. This is how dangerous it can be. We have to be careful that we are always following the direction that God gave us. We're going to talk more about this tonight when we talk about the way. So I hope that you're able to come back tonight so we can learn about the way. <coughs> if my throat is going to hold out, excuse me. But Jesus takes it even farther than what we think. We th we're thinking hatred is just something out of control. I hate you. I can't stand you. I'm... Ah! Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, 21 and 22, 
You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to the judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. The, to the hell of fire. You see, it's not just about our actions. It's about our attitudes. As I was telling the teenagers last week, it's not just what happens here that matters. It's what happens here that is even more important. It's our intent. It's our heart. And when our heart is not in line with God's, we put ourselves in opposition to God. So what then makes us a foe of God? Well, in, in James, he plainly says it. When we are a friend of the world, when what's going on in the world is more important to us than what God has given us, then we are a foe of God. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says something even more profound. And we often kind of read past this. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. That hate, that despise, that's enmity. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now the mammon he's referring to here is that of the world's wealth. What is important to the world cannot be important to us. What is important to us is the word of God. We see the parables and all the in Psalms talking about how it's, the word of God is more, more valuable than gold and silver. Do we really believe that? Or do we give up our time to worship so that we can go make money somewhere else? I know I'm supposed to worship you, God, but hey, I got a chance to make a big, a big killing over here. I'm going to do this, do this job. Where's your allegiance? Because you can't serve both. This also means that you can't be a part-time Christian. We can't spend part of our day loving God and part of our day loving the world. You see, because when we do, when we love the world, it separates us from God. In the book of 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all this is in the world, the desires of flesh, the desires of eyes, the pride of life is not in from the Father, but it's from the world. Another way to say it's from the world is to say it's from Satan. He's the one that puts those temptations in our way to try to trip us up. Because you see, sin, any sin at all, stains our souls and keeps us separated from God. Take a look at the book of James, chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure, undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We have to separate ourselves from the world. Those things that are important to the world cannot be that important to us. It says in another verse that we are to be called out, set apart, a peculiar people. 
And to the world, I'm sure we probably look peculiar. Why are you going to church on Sunday? There's football games on. Don't you know about that? Why are you going to church on Sunday? You could go to work. They pay time and a half for Sundays. You can make more money. These are the things that are important to the world. But we can't let them become important to us because when we let them become important to us, we become in opposition to God. We become enmity to God. And in doing so, we become his enemy, his foe. What about becoming a friend of God? That's where I want to be. I mean, Mike, you're kind of being awful dark and, and pretty much a downer so far. I understand. But sometimes before you can see the light, you have to see the darkness to get your way through. And once you understand the darkness, you can then move toward the light. Because this is what I want. I want to be a friend of God. I want to have him look at me on that end day and go, I was waiting for you. Come on in. If I stand before God and he's frowning, it's not a good sign. I want him smiling going, welcome. It was a movie I was watching last night. It was an interesting movie on, on golf and a young man who was being taught by an older man how to improve his game. At the end, he took him for a valuable lesson and he took a box. He says, all the things that are true, I want you to write on a piece of paper and put in your pocket. All the things that are a lie that you've heard throughout your life, write on a piece of paper. Put in this box and bury it right here. And then on the headstone, write your epitaph. When you leave this world, what do you want on your headstone. What do you want the world to see? What do you want the world to know about you after you've gone? That got me thinking. My th first thought was, I told you I was sick. I thought, nah, most people wouldn't get it. <laughs> and I finally decided, you know what I'd like on my headstone? Loving father, husband, you know the usual. But on the bottom, I wanted to say, he loved the Lord God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his mind. And he loved his neighbor as himself. I want the world to know I was a friend of God. And I loved him. And I loved his creation. And I loved his people. That's my goal. And I hope you have a very similar goal, that you want to be friends of God, not enemies of God. You see, when we follow Christ, we get to live forever. In the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 17, it says, And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. If we do the will of God, we abide forever. Not only do I get to follow God's teachings, which are always for my benefit, there is nothing in God's teachings that I'm going to do that's going to hurt me. But I get rewarded at the end. You know, most times we think, well, if you do this really difficult thing that's not going to be a whole lot of fun, it'll be a big reward. Oh, Mike, if you'll go out and mow the lawn out in 110 degree heat, I'll give you 20 bucks. Yeah, that keeps me going, motivated. But I'm doing something I don't like. But if you gave me a choice without the reward, I'd say, no, I don't want to do that. God, on the other hand, is giving us something we need, that we want, that we love, his word. And he says, if you will follow my word, and you will love doing it. 
I will reward you with heaven for all eternity. How can you turn that down? And yet so much of the world will do so. We're told in Matthew 7 that only a few will find the way to heaven. Because they're willing to do what God says. To be a friend of God means we follow him. And he rewards us for doing so. And when we do what is right, again, we are God's friend. In the book of John, chapter 15, verses 14 and 15. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that you have done for my father, I have made known to you. That's what I love about God's word. He doesn't just tell us what to do, but why we should do it. He gives us the truth. We have the understanding. We have the teaching. And it's from love. And he sealed that teaching with his sacrifice, with his death. Saying, I love you so much that the only way we can get this sin off of your soul, this stain that you have, because you are an enemy of God, and you have been an enemy of God for your life up till now, the only way we can eliminate that stain is I have to die for you. And I will do it willingly. Jesus says, no man takes my life, I give it. He gave it for me. He gave his life for you so that our sins, the times that we fought against God, the times that we opposed God, the times that we decided it was better to try to overthrow God in our lives by committing sin, would be forgiven will be remembered no more as if it had never happened. He loves us that much. Abraham was a friend of God. Why? Because he obeyed God. In the book of James chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture is fulfilled that says, Abraham believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. The secret of all of this comes down to this simple fact. <coughs> to be a Christian... When I proclaim that I am a Christian, I am proclaiming I love the Lord God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind, and that I will do whatever he says, because he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then I will love my neighbor as myself. Who is my neighbor? Everybody I come into contact with is my neighbor. And I have to love them as I love myself. And I want the best for them. That's what it means to be a Christian. And not part-time. You see, sometimes we get this attitude in the world that, okay, I've done my part for God, now I'm going to go do my part for me. Realize that? They say, you know what? While I'm at home, I love God. But when I go to work, I'm going to blend in with them. And I'll tell some dirty jokes. Maybe we'll go for a drink after work. And I'm not going to talk to them about Jesus Christ and who God is. Because they might fire me. Do 
Do you love your job so much that you're willing to give up God for it? Then you become an enemy of God. See, we can't be part-time. We can't come home and be, let's open the Bible and read together, and then let me go to work and let me go act like an idiot. We have to be with God all the time. And when they come and say, hey, I heard this dirty joke, let me tell you about it. You go, look, I'm a Christian. I really don't appreciate that stuff. I really wouldn't want to hear it. But thanks anyway. You know what you did just then? You told that person you have integrity, that you love God, and that you have commitment and a conviction that they can't break through. You have shown your light into the world. And they may come back to you to find out more about that. I remember, it kind of blew me away at work one time. A gentleman was talking to me, and he approached me about God. And we were talking about the Bible. He says, you know what? I've never heard a Christian talk like you talk. I said, really? Why? Well, it's all about their feelings and their opinions and things. You always talk about what the Bible says. And there are things in the Bible that we can do that we didn't think we could do. And there are Bibles, things in the Bible that we can't do that... We thought you could do. I've never heard this before. I said, really? It's all right there. All you got to do is open the pages. The test I throw out is always this. If your company came out tomorrow morning and put out a memo that says, if you are a believing Christian, whether you talk to anybody else or not, if you are a believing Christian, you will be fired. Would you make it through the day? Does anybody know? Have you done anything to let your light shine at work? If not, you may want to think about that because you may be in opposition to God. God tells us to let our light shine. To spread the seed throughout the land to everyone, regardless of who they are. The world thinks that God, you can be only part-time, especially if you just show up on Sunday. I'm here twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday. I've done my part for God. The rest of the week, <laughs> I can be whoever I want to be. I can do whatever I want to do. I can run to the bars and drink with the boys. And I can go to the strip joints and sit with the guys at work. But on Sunday morning, I am here. On Sunday evening, I am here. And on Wednesday evening, I am here. You are not here. Your body might be here, but your mind isn't and your heart's not. Because we are in opposition to God when we love the world more than we love his word. We're in opposition to God when we think of that. I pray to God at the, at the table. Every time I eat, I, I thank God. and I pray before I go to bed every time. And, but the rest of the time, I don't even bother going to church. Why do I need to go to church? I'm praying to him. I give him thanks for my food. I give him thanks for all that I have. I acknowledge that he lives. Why do I need to go to church? Because he asked you to. You're missing out on the greatest thing he has given us here on this planet. A family. A family that loves each other, that cares for each other, that will do anything for each other. Like this family here. I love this family. Because this is a family. I know that if I had a need, I could make a phone call, and by the end of the day, I would have that need fulfilled. And when I have the smallest thing, like last Sunday evening, I had that cold. <clears throat> and I didn't want to infect anybody else. As you can see, I'm still fighting it with my throat. I had phone calls on Monday going, is there anything you need? Are you feeling better? You know what that does? That makes me feel loved. That makes me feel great. 
Why would I want to give that up? But the world says, hey, you prayed. You're a good person. You give to charity. That's good enough. No, it's not. Because you're putting yourself in opposition to God because you're saying, you know what, God? You may have said to gather together, but you know what? I got a better way. I'll just give to charity and I'll pray. And I'll be a loving Christian, but I will not go to church. Because that church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. In the words of Homer Walker Jr., preacher I learned under a long time ago, well, come on in. One more hypocrite won't hurt. If you're looking for the perfect church, you're not going to find it because nobody's perfect. You look for the church that follows God's word. You look for the church that loves God. You look for the church that loves each other. Because Jesus said, when you love each other, the world will know your mind. And this is what James is talking about. He's saying, are you a friend or a foe of God? Do you love his word? Do you love what he gives you? Will you follow his direction? Will you follow his teaching? Or will you stand in opposition to him? This is the question we have to ask ourselves each and every day. Am I a friend of God? Or am I a foe? 